listen, it's it's no secret. I mean, alcohol played its part in in both their lives. The story is that you know my grandmother was always around trying to patch things up or help things, and one day you know my she was defending my dad, I guess, and my mom said, "Well, you like him so damn much, you take him," and I guess she did. <laughs> I am Rob Ward. Welcome to a word on Westerns. You know, there's so many Western stars that we talk about and honor here on a word on Westerns. And these interviews every Sunday morning are a lot of fun for me, and I hope they're fun for you. One of the biggest stars, and I don't mean just tall, because he was, he was 6'4 or 6'5, is Rod Cameron. And Rod Cameron was in a couple of great Republic serials and then became a star of his own, starred in three TV series. And guess what? His son is here today, flew in from Florida. Tony Cameron, big tall guy like his dad. Tony, come on in. <laughs> All right, buddy. Good to see you. That's a pretty shirt you've got on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your dad, I know had several TV shows, but these were public serials that he did where he played a G-man. Yeah. He had been doing smaller parts in right. films, and all of a sudden, these were public serials. William Whitney, I think, directed mm -hmm. one of them with a great action director. It made him a star. No, it sure did. It catapulted him to the next level. You've seen those shows. Oh, sure. You know, what did you think of seeing your dad in those rugged He-Man roles? Oh, it was great. It was great. And, you know, there are a lot of funny stories because, of course, in, you know, like we talked about during the fight scenes, they searched for anything that wasn't broken and made sure they broke it. Because, I mean, <laughs> you know, they they had warehouses of balsa furniture. And and so they'd shoot. I mean, he said they, you know, they'd do 100, 100 sets a day, you know, and um, they they worked hard on the rest. And they had some of the greatest stuntmen in the business. Oh, yeah. there, Tom Steele and Yakima Kanut and Davy Sharp doing the the work, the doubling. But your dad did a lot of his own, didn't he? Yeah, he, he did a lot of the stunts. And, he, and it was interesting because it seemed like the movie was going at this speed. But then when they went to the fight scenes, they seemed to turn it up to 78. And it was like, so everything was just going fast. You know? <laughs> but you're so, right. They did destroy every, oh, yeah. everything yeah. from that. From those Republic serials, Universal Studios saw him and put him as the lead in a series of B-Westerns. I think he did six or seven of those, sure. replacing Tex Ritter, who mm -hmm. left Universal and said it was a mistake. He went and ended up doing probably PRC or Monogram or some Poverty Row studio, but then your dad became a star and a name from doing those B-Westerns and then left them. Kirby Grant took his place. I think your dad's film with Yvonne DiCarlo, Frontier Gal. Frontier Gal. In Technicolor. Oh, yeah, Salome, where she danced. Yeah. And they, yeah, they did, I think, three different movies together. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And, you know, I try and tell people, you know, this guys, you know, so who'd your dad date during those days? And I was like, well, you know, Yvonne DiCarlo. And they're like, who's that? And I said, well, remember Mrs. Munster? And they're like... Yeah. I said, no, no, you don't understand. Back then, she was really hot. She yeah, said, yeah. Yes, no. yes, no. Well, to Fred Munster, she was hot. Yes, then, exactly. Too. Yeah. Yeah. You came along much later than your dad's big heyday, but a couple of Westerns that he did that were all-star B-Western gatherings that Alex Gordon uh, right. produced, Requiem for a Gunfighter and The Bounty Killer. How old were you? And you went on location. So I was... Um, by 11 or 12 and you know i got to go on different you know location well not locations but i'd spend a day and i went on perry mason or i got to you know meet little little joe and haas on bonanza and um and un unfortunately i i think i told you i i i learned about what suicide was unfortunately because dad was doing uh um, alias smith and jones and that was he was on the episode where uh peter duel passed or took his life and then so that dad had to explain you know what happened how did he do that what did he say you know he just said he just said you know people you know have have things they fight with inside and sometimes they just can't conquer them and you know people handle it in different ways mm -hmm. so you know and so it was you know so that was kind of an interesting way to learn about that not the way you typically would but then um yeah so then my first two locations that i really got to go to were um uh the bounty killer 
and um recruit for a gunfighter and you know so you're going on those and boy it's like going to summer camp on steroids i mean it was like you know and and a lot of times i think um people didn't even know i was dad's son because i loved hanging out with the stunt man and then the special Were you effects tall guys. already then i uh, no, actually i i you know not yet not yet i, I had that growth spurt later on but, you know, it was great because I'm, you know, I'm hanging out with stuntmen and learning how to set squibs and blowing things up. And, you know, and then my grandmother was uh, British, so she liked me to dress properly. So she'd send me there, you know, to the set every day with him on location. And, and shorts and a leader. Well, I, I, I didn't know no leader hose, and that was, <laughs> that was another friend. But, but I wore, you know, nice shirts and things, and I'd come home at night, and, and I'm like, you know, my co this would be torn, this would be torn. And she goes, what happened to your shirt? I, I, I learned how to be dragged out of a bar, you know? And, and then, you know, and then I'd come back the, ne the next day, I'd come back and, you know, this, this would be torn, this. I learned how to fight, you know? And so she then just started putting me in an old t-shirts, you know, so. But the first was, yeah, um, the bounty killer, and that was uh, Dan Duryea. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was just a really nice man. And I, I think he had the same philosophy as dad. They were both very low key. I mean, they weren't out. I don't, you know, it's just weird. Dad never seemed to be wanting to be the biggest star. He he was doing a job and he wanted to be the best he could have been doing that job. So it was Dan Drie and he was he was such a nice man. I mean, I was big into my little league then. So anything that resembled a ball, he'd throw to me and I'd hit it with a stick and stuff. And then Buster Crab was on it. And Ooh. that was, you know, the guy was a gold medalist. I Did mean, you already know who some of these people were? No, I, I didn't know. I knew Dan Duryea, mm -hmm. but Buster Crab. I mean, I'd heard about him, but you know, here I'm seeing an a Olympic gold medalist, and I think even, I think even the other men, you know, even the stuntmen thought this is pretty cool. I mean, first of all, the guy's like six four, great looking, and he was a gold medalist. So you know, the women are drooling over him, and the guys are like, wow, that's cool. So, and then, um, and then there was Audrey Dalton. And uh, so kind of my first time being around, I guess, a real pretty starlet. And I, I think dad, after about the fourth time of me saying, wow, she's really pretty. You know, he, I think he finally said, son, they're, they're all pretty, okay? So, you know, <laughs> but then, so fast forward, I got to go maybe two, three years later, I got to go on my first like cross country location. And we went to Kissimmee, Florida for Name of the Game. That was with Tony Franciosa and Robert Stack. I spent uh, four days watching Jill St. John walk around in a tiny little bikini. So my idea of what a really pretty lady changed a lot in, <laughs> in that time. We won't tell Audrey. No, you know? no. Okay. And, then, uh, and then another sidebar, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this being around all the Westerns. Um, this had a great impact on me, the memory I still have not as probably as much as Joe St. John's bikini, but <laughs> but um, there was a scene that uh, so Dad is a cattle rancher, and there's all this rustling going on, and so this one big scene, and I don't know who the writer was on this, but obviously he'd never maybe been around animals and guns because it's a there there's a big corral full of steer, and Dad's on one side and the rustlers on the other side. And they're shooting each other across a corral full of steer. Mm. And, you know, so all hell's breaking loose. And two of the steer decide, you know what, I'm out of here, you know. <laughs> so they break through the top two bar, you know, um, fence posts there and jump over. And to this day, it just amazed me. Those steer know the difference between real cowboys and stuntmen and everybody from the studio because they ran right by the cowboys and stuntmen, they just slapped them on the ass as they went by and chased every studio person up trees, <laughs> under cars, on top of cars, and just were relentless. They were seeking them out. And meanwhile, he just they just could have cared less about the other ones. Oh. So yeah, so that was that was kind of interesting. That's exciting. Well, now on on those two westerns, because it was Bob Steele and Johnny Mac Brown. What was Johnny Mac Brown like? He was in both of them. I think he was in yeah. ba Bounty Killer and Requiem for a Gunfighter. Yeah. So once again, you know, as a kid being into sports, he was. I think he was a football player at Alabama. Mm -hmm. He was an MVP at the Rose Bowl. So I, I, this was pretty cool. And you know, he brought a football, and we, you know, he taught me how to run with a football. And then Lane Chandler. Mm -hmm. um, and to me. It was interesting. Lane Chandler to me was like first 
kind of real cowboy actor. Well, he'd been a silent movie star and then never stopped working. He was then a sidekick a couple of times with John Wayne, but you'd see him pop up even in Cheyenne episodes in Maverick. He mm -hmm. just kept working as a character actor. A nice man. Well, he's a great guy. And, and to me, like I said, to me, he was the first cowboy because he would put me on a horse every day and he would talk to me about, you know, how you talk to horses and how you handle horses or how you act around a horse. So they, you know, that was, that was pretty neat. Of course, there was Mike Mazurki. Mm -hmm. He was oh, in it. Yeah. yeah. Good guy. Oh yeah. yeah. So people have asked me you know, over the years, you know, were you one of those spoiled Hollywood or out of control Hollywood kids? And I said, when your dad's six five, he practices cracking a whip in the backyard and you see him beat up grown men on TV, you don't push the envelope. You know? Yeah, so a smart kid. Yeah, yeah. So but had Mike Mazurki been my dad, I wouldn't even looked at the envelope because the man was a mountain. And he had that cauliflower ear and that craggly skin and he was the perfect villain and bad guy. But as big as he was, he was the biggest teddy bear. And I mean, mm -hmm. he was a professional football player, basketball player, and then wrestler. And mm -hmm. that's how he got the mm -hmm. ear. Mm -hmm. And he had a charity for wrestler, old wrestlers and stuff. But, you know, he would, uh, he'd let me get him in a headlock and tap out, you know, <laughs> like, he, you know, I won that's and so stuff cool. like that. And so, yeah. you know, so he was, uh, it was great. Yeah. Well, there was an old guy in The Bounty Killer that you may not have even noticed. And he is the first cowboy star in movies bronco billy anderson yeah. was in that film i didn't really yeah i don't i yeah, i know but why would you but yeah. uh, who's the old guy you know that's right and everybody raises their hand yeah. because it's a lot of metrics yeah. right yeah and it, you know it was interesting because my wife who's here she's actually uh in equestrian and she's an adventure in horses and stuff like that but when we started watching some of my dad's movies she said what do you realize how good a rider your dad is I said, well, no, everybody rode horses. I mean, they all rode. You know, he took off on a horse with these bad guys chasing him on bareback and hauling ass, you know, down the trail. And they'd have to have a pretty big horse. He was, how tall yeah. was he really? He was 6'5". Uh-huh. Yeah. He was from Canada. From Canada. Yep. How did he get involved in films? Dad and his, uh, and his mom lived in, uh, in Calgary. And um, unfortunately, it was, it's kind of interesting because my mom passed when I was 13 and his dad died when he was just a couple months short of 13. Mm. So um, he then went to New Jersey, New Jersey and was working in the tunnels there and then came out to California to work with the, the Water Transit uh, Authority on California. And, you know, things, uh, you know, were tough there. And so then he heard about, you know, these guys are making a movie and you got 12 bucks a day and, and you got lunch and breakfast. So, <laughs> you know, so he went out and auditioned and... He got a few, you know, got to do some stand-in work and, you know, did did a few tests. He played a Mountie in the Cecil B. DeMille right. Northwest Mounted Police. Right, too. yeah. And that was always his dream, you know, being from Calgary, he wanted to be a, a Mountie. His his life certainly would have been changed had he had he been one. But, um, no, so then he, you know, I think his, his first test was for um, Golden Boy, which William William Holden got. Mm -hmm. And then his uh, first real role he got you know, a small part was with Betty Davis. And it was, I think with the old maids or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And he got all his friends and he said, I'm, you know, I'm in the movies now. And so he got his girlfriend and all his friends and they went to the movie and they kept waiting and waiting and they, he got left on the editing floor. Oh. <laughs> so, so I guess that girl thought, well, at oh, least yeah. he got a breakfast and lunch. Yeah, right? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. His Westerns really have a nice following and he ended up co-starring with George Montgomery and uh, and Forrest Tucker in, in other films, but his TV series, too, were very popular, and those were syndicated shows. I don't think they right. were network, so he would end up doing 60 or 70 episodes of City Detective and stuff. I remember watching those. Yes, uh, City Detective, State Trooper, and Coronado 9. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's funny, um, you know, because I did watch some of those with him, but and I think I was, you know, 13 or so and and it is you know i think one of the scenes is buxom redhead is pressing herself up on was she in a bikini no no okay, okay. <laughs> um but buxom uh -huh. so um but she's pressing herself up on dad and he said cool your jets tomato and i said what 
I said, Dad, did you, did you really say that? Where, where did that come from? Uh, I want to see that episode. Now. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like, cool your Jets tomato? That's so, great. That's yeah. a great dialogue back then. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, he did, and it, it's funny because, you know, he did nine years of detectives, mm-hmm. but yet he got on a horse and he said, once he got on a horse, he was always known as the, the Western star. Mm-hmm. Well, Westerns, the, the people who make Westerns and were in them, Love them, and there's a nice quality uh, I've always found about people who made westerns. The morals are are right there, and the people who grew up watching them want to make them. What is it about the West, the westerns? Well, first of all, Dad, because he did, you know, he did so many genres of, of different types of movies, but he really had a, a a soft spot in his heart for the western fans. I mean, he just said. You know, they're so consistent, they're so loyal. He said they know the director, they know the cast, they know the locations. And he said they're, they're just fantastic. And I think, you know, like the, you talked about earlier, um, is just that Westerns, and, and I think we need this now, Westerns, like there's, there's the good, there's the bad. You know, if you don't do the right thing, you're punished. You treat people well. Um, there's family values. You know, it's, it's just all the things that we should be. You know, and I think that that's a, people are yearning for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It does seem like people are are back to that and need that because of all these the darkness that we see in films oh, yeah. and on in real life because of the internet and we're fed all of these things that right. we, we weren't aware of before. Probably some of it's good, some of it's bad. Right, right. Now, one thing I want to ask you that, that you, you know I read about is that. One of the women that your dad married, he was married a couple of times, you know, it was Hollywood. He divorced her and married her mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> what kind of tomato was she? <laughs> uh, she? She was a very short little tomato, a little pretty short tomato. Um, yeah, my dad was called, uh, I forget by which director, the bravest man in Hollywood because he married his mother-in-law. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, which was a great line. But, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was, it was interesting. Um, once, you know, I didn't know any different. I mean, she was, she was always my grandmother mm-hmm. and, and it really messed with, and, and I kind of learned as, as, once I got into a teenager, we'd go to premieres and things like that, that I was going to use this for some fun. So we'd, we'd go to these things, and some people knew kind of the grandmother. Did you call her gran- granny mom? No, no. Oh, we just stuck with granny. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> we'd go to these premieres, and people would walk up, and they'd say, you know, where are your parents? I'd say, well, my grandmother and father are over there. And so then they'd walk up and see, and he'd introduce his wife. So they always thought there was somebody missing. They're like, well, I heard the grandmother was there but we met the wife or I heard the wife was there but we never saw the grandmother you know so I had I, I, don't know. I had a great time with that yeah, <laughs> so, well. so so how old were you when that happened then when they got married yeah oh I was probably just like one one you know there was a there was there was like 20 years difference between my mom and dad so he was you know peaking at his career maybe on the tail you know my mom's 21 years old you know and so you know, she's still vibrant, you know, ready to party and have a blast. And, and so they, you know, just... Uh, Did you live with your dad or with your I lived with my mom. Uh-huh. And, but, you know, and, and listen, it's, it's no secret. I mean, alcohol played its part in, in both their lives. Mm-hmm. And um, so the story is that, you know, my grandmother was always around trying to patch things up or help things. And one day, you know, my she was defending my dad, I guess, and my mom said, "Well, you like him so damn much, you take him." And uh, I guess it, she did. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and it worked out though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just, oh no, it did. It, I mean, she, you know, she was. Listen, you know, dad came from very humble beginnings. I mean, uh, I, Patrick and I were talking about our dads and you know where we they came from and just how gracious they were to the fans and stuff, but. I remember during Christmas, the Salvation Army would be out there and he'd put $100 in there. And, you know, back then I was like, holy smokes, you know, and I'd ask my grandmother, I said, so what's the story with the Salvation Army, you know? And he said, well, because they actually took care of your, your, your dad and his mom mm-hmm. and they fed them, they clothed them. So they were having, you know, so, you know, he, you know, he, 
tough beginnings. Whereas my grandmother, she was an ambassador's wife. She spoke five languages and she traveled the world. And I think he was a bit enchanted by that. Mm -hmm. And, and she just was, you know, very solid, you know, and, and just, you know. Well, have you turned out great and you're tall and good looking. Did you ever want to pursue acting? Um, you know, sports were kind of my, my thing at mm -hmm. the time. And, and, um, and I did, you know, I did a few commercials here and there, I modeled for a while and, but I, I never, you know, I, I'd go on the cast and things and, and they talk about you like you're not even there. Well, he's got kind of bedroom eyes, but I don't know if we could use him for this. And, you know, well, it's tall, but he can't that. I'm like, I, I'm right here, you know, it's, 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 you know, and so, so, uh, you know, I just, and, um, I, I don't know, it, it just, I saw you know, it's it's not as glamorous glamorous a life as people think it mm -hmm. is. You know, and well, it's so, a lot of work. As we, it know. is a lot of work, and and you know, when you have a lot of time on your hands, sometimes you go the wrong ways with it. So, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I'm glad you spent time with us today, Tony. This oh, absolutely, has been terrific. This has been great, and I want to thank you for all you've done to keep uh, the memories of the westerns mm -hmm. and the people behind the camera and in front of the camera alive. Well, it means you. a lot to uh, the families like us. Thank you. That was a cue to applause. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah.